Good morning. And Happy New Year to you all. Imagine that this is the first day of the first month of the first, the new year. And uh, I welcome you to this service this morning. Um, It's it's going to be hard not to be writing 22 on your checks until the middle of the year or something like that. When you get used to it, then you've got to get used to 24. And uh, so I welcome you, those who are with us here this morning, those in the foyer, those who are joining with us online. And I know that there are people who are meeting with us thus, and I trust that uh, beginning next week when we turned, we return to our regular schedule that uh, we'll see more of our folks and uh, we'll be able to get on with the work which God has called us to do. Um, I, I want to begin by not only welcoming you, but thanking you for your gracious gift to me at Christmas and your prayers. Um, it's, it's a different Christmas for me and uh, um, the prayers of God's people. And I've, got, I've gotten this from around the country, up in Canada and, and here. And so I want you to know that it is not taken for granted. I live by it. I look for it. And thank you so very, very much. I think that sometimes we say that words are not capable of expressing what one feels. And I can assure you that this is the case now. But it is greatly, greatly appreciated. And I want to thank you. We don't have a number of announcements this week because, of course, things are really um, almost sleeping until the 4th, this coming Wednesday, when we will begin with um, the soup supper at 6. The singers will be meeting at 5.30 for their practice, and we will um, return to the study of the book of Mark. And I trust that uh, you will want to be a part of that study Mark is the gospel that, that generates excitement in the hearts of the disciples, early disciples, for the person of Jesus Christ. And I trust that we will return to that with the same kind of excitement. And the next Sunday, Lord's willing, we will return to the book of Nehemiah. I think it's important that we finish that, that study because it has some tremendous important principles which are useful for us here in this century. Uh, God's word might be old, but it is not out of date. And um, I want you to know that I look forward uh, to that. I think, Lori, you have an announcement. Good morning and Happy New Year. Anxious to start 2023, at least at our home we are. Couple announcements. I want to remind all the ladies that the Ladies Winter Social is January 14th from 9 to 10:30. Again, come and enjoy um, what we have prepared for you, and um, find out what we're doing for the next three months. And um, Liz McGarry will be telling her story. So please come and support that and um, enjoy that time. Um, during Ladies Winter Social, we will also be picking our new Simply Sisters. Not really picking them, but if you already are doing a Simply Sister, we'll be switching. And if you haven't participated the last three months, we're gonna have a sign up and you you are welcome to participate. Very low key, um, not secret. So come and find out about that too. If you haven't picked up the upcoming ladies events, um, again, this is very just short so you can get it on your calendar, what's coming up, not much detail, but talks about the social and the book club and, and the ladies' lunch that we will be starting in January. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And uh, Paul will call, come now and call us to worship. Please stand as he calls us to worship. <coughs> Praise God. So good to be here and to see each one of you this January 1st morning. Let's read from... Psalm chapter 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust. You say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they are like grass, which sprouts anew. 
In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. 
Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. It blows our minds, Lord, because we tried everything we know has a beginning and an end, but not so with God. We come to the one from whom time comes. We come to the one from whom life comes. In fact, the apostle, the, the writer to the Acts, Luke said, in you we live and move and have our being. We're breathing this first day of a new year because God has brought us through the past year. And Father, as we begin this new year, we look to you and we trust in a fresh way. It, it is my prayer, our God, and our prayer this morning that the year ahead will be a year of blessings from God not blessings so that we might consume it upon ourselves, but that this community will get to know that our God reigns. That this community will get to know that Jesus saves. That this community will know that it exists because God has been pleased to give it life and motion and breath. We come to give you thanks, Father. You have protected us. You have taken us through dark times, through tears and triumph. You have provided for us. You have protected us. How gracious you have been, and that is why we open our service this morning with the song, Our God is Faithful. And when we could not see your hands, we could trust your heart. And when there was no light, you, you became our light in darkness. And so we give you thanks that you are our God from everlasting to everlasting. Give us the ability to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth to confess our dependence upon you, to confess our need for cleansing, for renewing, for freshness. We pray, Father, that like the psalmist in Psalm 27, 
we would gather here as we are this morning to seek the face of the Lord and to seek it earnestly, to desire to get to know God, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, that we will seek our God, not our own thing here this morning, but we will seek your will, your blessing, so that others might benefit from our being here today. For this, we give you our grateful thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Communion Sunday, and I deliberately planned it so that it might be the first day, not the day, but that we'd have communion on this day, on uh, the first day of the year. What a wonderful way to begin the year, to acknowledge God as the one who is our life, the one who gives us breath, the one who has saved us, and to perhaps in the work of the Spirit of God in this service this morning and wherever you are listening to my voice, that you might come to a fresh understanding of who Jesus Christ is and wanting to say, like the old song we used to sing when I became a Christian, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The Nicene Creed unites us. Creed unites us. It gives us the ability to know why we exist, what we're doing, what our life is all about, what our church is all about. And I ask you now to stand and uh, repeat with me and remain standing for the song after we sing, after we repeat the Nicene Creed. Let's repeat together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, the very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's sing one song. I think we can say that this was, has been one of our favorites. He will hold me fast, after which the children will be dismissed.
take time to pray once more. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your faithfulness and how you have sustained and protected us this past week and through this past year of 2022. Also, we thank you for the privilege of prayer that allows us through Jesus Christ to come before the God of the universe. This morning, Father, we continue to hold up in prayer the Kellogg family, and we just pray that you would continue to sustain them. Father, we pray for the family of our brother Doug Smith that passed away just before Christmas. We ask for the safety for those still traveling and trying to return home to school or work. We thank you for our Doug, for excuse me, for Dwayne and Pam. Uh, for I know that they probably had some harrowing times getting back here. And, and Father, we we praise you that uh, you allowed them to be with us this morning. Father, we thank we pray for those that are still suffering the effects of the cold and snow that gripped our nation this past week. We, th we pray for those missionaries serving on the field, some under threatening conditions. They missed, many of them missed seeing loved ones during the Christmas season. And also we pray for those of our congregation that are continuing, continuing to suffer from the effects of the flu bug. We think of our brother Leonard dealing with an issue, health issue, Father, and we just would hold him up this morning. We pray, Father, for your healing touch on him. Father, we pray for the wisdom of the doctors. Father, we thank you for the many answers to the prayer needs of our Sodaville congregation uh, this past year. We ask that the people who heard the Christmas message proclaimed from your word throughout the world will open their hearts to receive your free gift of grace. 
We also ask for your presence and blessing on our community and the ministry of Sotoville Church in this coming new year. Father, help us individually and corporately to be a beacon of light and hope in a dark world. And finally, Father, we thank you for the gifts that will be received at the end of the service. As always, we dedicate these gifts to the furtherment of your kingdom. And all, and all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, in the communion service, we changed the schedule around just a little bit so that our focus is entirely not upon a problem we might have or a concern we might be carrying a burden. Those are wonderful, wonderful things that we take to him. But if he is not whom he claims to be, taking them would be just in vain. And so we want to for the next few minutes, look at a text. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And while I'm looking at one verse, one verse, I trust that God will open up this one verse like a flower to you and to me. It's amazing as I studied this text, what it did for me. I have known this verse for a long time, as long as I have been a Christian. And I don't remember, I, I may have, but I don't remember having spoken on it as I am going to speak on it this morning. Because I don't know if it has to do with my experience or whatever it may be, but if ever I saw the need for this verse of Scripture to come as a fresh, fresh revelation to you and to me, it is this morning. Not because of personal concerns, but because of global concerns. We, we, we live in a world that is in, in flux in such a way that, that you know... Um, one, one of the interesting things uh, we experienced this past winter, um, friends of mine, we were coming back from a place um, in, in West Salem, and I decided to take them on a new route. I wanted to show them that you could get to our place in more than one way. And before I could get to the entrance of this place, the snow started to fall. And so I thought, oh no. So I am making my way up. And my vehicle started to go this way. And then people were coming. And they were going. C.S. Lewis has a line. I love this line. He said this. We exist in a world where we have questions about, it's, it's like being in an ocean, he said. And, and there are ships coming towards you and you are going toward them. And you spend your time trying to prevent from colliding with these ships. And if we don't know how those ships got there, and if we don't know why we are here, we may end up colliding with one another. And, and that's how I, I, I saw. Uh, there was one uh, car driven by a young lady, and my, my vehicle was trying to make it up the hills, and she, hers was trying to come back. And I thought, oh boy, I, I better learn what I'm going uh, to do here. And I finally decided to do something. I decided to just park my car and decided to walk. No, I wasn't dressed to be walking in the snow. So John and I are going up the hill walking. And we're talking and talking. And all of a sudden, my feet went from under me and I fell. It was embarrassing. There was nobody to see me except John. So I didn't feel too badly. But I got up 
And I started to walk again, and in 10 feet, second time. Life. Isn't that life? You get up, you start to walk, and all of a sudden, you fall again. Well, when you think of this world, this, that's the kind of world we're living in. Apart from the news of being with your families this week, what good news did you hear from your radio or television this week? I, I can't think of one. I really can't. The sports world, the players are more important than the game. They think they own it. And if they don't get what they want, they pout getting what one guy is making, uh, what, $200 million to play soccer? Man. And if he doesn't get what he wants, guess what he's going to do? He's going to walk away. That's life. I mean, every, everything we hear just challenges everything that, that we know, that we live, that we were brought up with. And then we come to a text like this. The text reads, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now that's not an isolated text. It, it is sandwiched between two things. One, verse 7, are the people who spent their whole lives telling us what God has done. The writer to this book began by saying, in times past, in different ways, God spoke through the prophets, but now he's speaking through his son. And then in verse 9, he says this, do not be carried away by varied and strange teaching, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace not by food, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. So don't, don't live for what you can see, because everything you see is changing. If, if you don't believe that, just get a copy of your yearbook for your high school. And look at your high school picture. Reminds me of the, the fellow who saw a picture, um, a photography uh, of his, his image, and he's, he said, this doesn't do me justice. And the photographer said, mister, you need mercy, not justice. <laughs> Everything we know is changing. And in the middle of all this, this those who have spoken to us, the experience we're going through, there is one stable, constant, unmovable reality which makes both of these things pale in significance. I came across this while I was studying. I thought it was a great line. This was written back in 1970. Everyone is facing changes. No one knows what's going on. And everybody changed places and still the world keeps moving on. Now love must always turn to sorrow and everyone must play the game because it's here today and gone tomorrow but the world keeps the same. What he means by that is what we saw, how people behave yesterday, is exactly the way they're behaving today. What they used to think yesterday, that's the same way they're thinking today. And here comes this verse of scripture. It says, everything around us, you are changing. Things are changing. But there is someone whose change is absolutely necessary if we are to face the changing world in which we live. And so I want to take the next few moments to talk about Jesus Christ, the perpetual contemporary. 
And I want to begin by looking to take this verse of Scripture apart in three ways. Jesus Christ in history yesterday. Jesus Christ in mystery today. Jesus Christ in perpetuity, the future. And see, at, at whatever point you move in history, we're going to have the communion this morning. And, and you know what it says? When we take the communion, we look back. We take it presently until he comes, future. So that, that we are facing an unmovable reality in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so let's begin by looking at Jesus Christ in history. This is not speaking of yesterday, like yesterday was Saturday and the day before. That's not what the word means. Yesterday goes back into time and space. We, we read in John 1, in the beginning, when, when things came into creation, in the beginning was the word. A few weeks ago, I shared with you about the fact that in the United Kingdom, 40% of those who were asked, 40% said they do not believe that Jesus Christ was a real person. 40% in the United Kingdom. The rest of that survey, 22% of them believed that he was a good teacher and nothing more except a fictional character or mythical at best. That's in 2015. Right in your time and mine. I couldn't find such a survey. I guess I could have gone to other places, but I didn't need to. But what I did find out, 52% of all Americans were surveyed believed that Jesus Christ was nothing more than a good teacher. 52% of Americans. Dear friends, listen. If Jesus Christ was only a good teacher, he wouldn't say the things he said. A good teacher would not make statements that, not, that is not true. So, I, I want you to look just briefly at Jesus in history and look at, I'm only going to use two, external, external biblical things outside of the Bible that spoke of the presence of Jesus Christ in space and time. I call this the, the, the external biblical testimony. The most respected Jewish historian, a fellow by the name of Josephus. Josephus was a first century Jewish historian, a military leader, best known for his great work and what is, what, what is uh, dealing with the Jewish wars with Rome and so on. He came from a Jewish family, not a believer, but just, I just took a little bit of what he wrote in his, in his ideas about, uh, about Jesus. He said this, <clears throat> he wrote this in A.D. 93, Jesus was a first century preacher and religious teacher who was the central figure of Christianity and was believed by most Christians to be the incarnate God, the Son, the expected Messiah. Josephus was not a Christian. He was a Jew who did not believe that the Messiah was going to come in the flesh. But he is writing now about what happened at that time. That Jesus Christ walked on the face of the earth. He was seen. He talked to people. Women tried to touch the tassel of his garment. He raised a young girl. To, I mean, he was alive. He was not the, the makeup of the the, the apostles and so on, if you please. I'm just going to look at him, Josephus, saying that Jesus Christ was a real person. But there was one other, Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman historian who was no friend of Christianity. He was born in, in 56 AD and, and wrote that Jesus was, was called Christ. Jesus was called Christ and was executed under Tiberius, who was the, the governor, the emperor, and Pilate, who governed Jerusalem and the Jewish nation from AD 26 to 36. 
there was there, 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 there were many other things that he said, but he said, Jesus, who was called the Christ, was crucified. He went to, he went to a cross. So this was not the makeup of the imagination of people. In history, Jesus Christ truly and re in reality existed. He was not someone made up. It, he was not some kind of a God made up by antiquity so that we would have someone to believe in. Jesus Christ in history was a real person. But I want to go to the internal biblical testimonies. And I'm going to just summarize again from Luke chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. I'm just going to use Luke. I could use Matthew. I can use um, um, John if I wanted to, but I'm just going to use Luke here. Listen to what he says. And by the way, well-known historians in our time said that one of the most accurate historians to write concerning Christianity has been Luke the physician. So he was not again a fool. Listen to what he said. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us. Accomplished about, by who? By Jesus. Just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us. It seemed fitting for me as well. Listen now. Having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out to you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Now, we don't know who Theophilus is, but Theophilus might be in here this morning because there might be a Theophilus who needs to understand who Jesus Christ was or is. And Luke is saying, I have taken, as a medical doctor, with, with careful investigation, the things that, that you have heard, I have gone through them, I have talked to eyewitnesses, they were there. Perhaps Mary, the mother of Jesus, was one with whom Luke, Luke uh, spoke. And he said, I am writing these things to you that you might know this. You might know this. That those things that you might have a certain, unmovable, unshakable faith concerning the incarnation. Because the first thing that he does was to tell us about the the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The first thing Luke does in writing everything about Christ, he begins with the virgin birth. And the virgin birth was, by the way, the means by which Jesus Christ came into the world. And then Luke traces his whole life for us. Everything he did until he was taken up to glory. The Bible, my friends, presents Jesus Christ to us as a person of history who walked in space-time. He was known at time mistakenly so as, as Joseph's son. People saw him. They knew him. After he was born and Mary and Joseph came together, Mary gave birth to other children. They were known as the brothers of Christ, and you can read about them in John chapter 7. Let me close this first part, Jesus in history, with these words from one of my favorite men. Listen to what he said. Incomparably, the most important watershed in the long history of humanity has been the incarnation of Christ. At this point, the streams are divided. After the birth of Christ, after this, the human course and direction are changed. One figure split history into two so that at every event, at any event now dated and referenced to his coming, either before or after, is either B.C. or A.D. No one has split history. Caesar did not. Alexander the Great did not. 
No one you can think about. But when Jesus Christ came in, history was split into two. And if he was not a real person, my friends, you couldn't be worshiping something that did not exist. Jesus Christ was a real person. And what, what the writer to the Hebrews is telling us, that in, in, in space and time, Jesus Christ made claims. He made promises. He did miracles. He was crucified, as Josephus said. But he was not only crucified. He was buried. But he was not only buried. He rose again. And he did not only rise again. He ascended to heaven. And so that brings us to Jesus in mystery. Jesus in mystery. You know, um, we have had books and movies made saying that Jesus was seen in Spain and Jesus was seen in different places. And I thought, how would they know that that was Jesus? <laughs> the idea that, that you have seen Jesus somewhere in Europe is as ludicrous as uh, me being a millionaire. I think that's the best thing I can think about. Yeah. Where is he now? Jesus walked. I, I, I remember when we were in Jerusalem, and, and we, were, we, were, we were walking. Each, each of us was assigned that certain things we were supposed to do while we were there, and, and we were able to choose them if we, if we, we chose uh, and, and in time. And so I, I chose, I wanted to go to the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was transfigured before his disciples. And, and I remember walking, no, I'm sorry, I was not walking. They walked. I was being driven in a Mercedes. It wasn't mine. It was part of the, 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 the uh, tour I was on. And as we were driving up there, believe me, I was holding on to my breath. Because those Arabs, I mean, they know it. I don't. And when we're turning around some of those hills, my word, I was thinking, oh, oh watch it, buddy. <laughs> and then we got to the top. And, and, and believe me, as I'm standing here, I remember what the devil said to Jesus. He took him up to a high pinnacle and showed him all the expanse of things. And, and I remember standing there looking, causing my eyes to move across the horizon, looking up and looking down. I think this is where Jesus was changed before the disciples. This is, this, is where, this is where the voice came from heaven and said to the disciples, this is my beloved son, listen to him. What? But he wasn't there. He, he, he was there in history. But he wasn't up in that mountain in mystery. So where is he in mystery? Ah, friends, I have a good news for you. Today, the Jesus who said all those things that he did yesterday is presently. Listen, we said it in the Nicene Creed. Creed. He was, he was not only born, not only lived, he died, but he was ascended. He went back to where he was for all eternity, and something is taking place even as you are sitting listening to my voice right now. Jesus Christ is actively doing for you and for me what he did for the disciples when he was on earth. Let me give you a couple of examples. 2 John, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 says this. 1 John chapter 2. Talking to the Christians who were beginning to get this courage in his day. And John wrote this. My beloved children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if you sin, that's two John, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. If you sin, listen to what he says. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate is a defense 
for someone who is guilty of a crime. And just as Jesus prayed for Peter that he might not fall when he failed, the scripture says that that is exactly what he's doing in heaven on your side, on, on, for your sake and mine right now. Romans chapter 8 verse 33 says this, Who can bring a charge against God's elect people? The devil does. The, de the devil says, look, look, look at Winston. He stands before those people and he goes home. And what is he like in his home? He talks about driving on the road and look at the way he's driving. Now, I'm not telling you that I violate any of those things. I want you to know. I'm just giving you the, an example. But when the devil goes before God and how he does, my friends, I don't know. Job chapter 1 gives us the same thing. When the children of God came to give a report to God, the devil also came. And, and the devil takes your failure and my failure and put it in the face of God and says, yeah, look at him though. And Jesus said, I have paid for their sins. I have taken care of their failure. I have taken care of their deceit. I have taken care of their defeat. He is my advocate. And I don't argue with the devil. I claim my advocate as my defense. And when I fail, I confess my sins. And he is just and willing to forgive me and to cleanse me from all sins. Jesus in mystery. Time is running. I could say more, but I'll go on. Look at his, that, that was his legal ministry on your behalf and mine. Look at his priestly ministry. Hebrews 7.25. Jesus Christ is in heaven where he presently and eternally live before God praying for us. In 1, P, in 1 John 2, he is our legal defense. In Hebrews 7.25, he is our priestly representative so that my spiritual life is maintained by what Jesus does for me in his intercessory ministry that I might keep on we were singing the song, He Will Hold Me Fast. I chose that song deliberately. Because sometimes, my friends, we feel that we're not going to make it. Sometimes our spiritual life is challenged by what we see, what we know, what we, what we experience in our own lives. It happens. And sometimes we wonder if, if God is ever going to do anything with these lives of ours. Jesus went to Peter and he said, Peter, Satan wants to defeat you, but I have prayed for you. Friends, please listen. The priestly ministry is where our spiritual life is attended to in heaven as Jesus is there. It is not, uh, you know, when I, one, several writers as I was studying this text says this, when we say Jesus is praying, Please don't think that Jesus is before the Father saying, please, Father, please. No, that's not what it means at all. The very presence of Jesus there means that we are represented. His presence is his prayer. At any point, at any point at all, in, in, in heaven, Jesus Christ represents us before the Father in our fallenness, in our defeat, whatever the case may be. And he is praying, and you are going to make it to heaven. I am going to make it to heaven because he's praying for us. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be making it there in my own bootstrings. I'm not going to do the best I can so that he, no, no. He is praying for all who are coming to God by him. And please listen, 
And this is why I say he's not this. He ever lives to do that. Which, which means that, that when we die and go to heaven, the presence of Jesus is our representative before the Father. And we are accepted in the beloved. That's Jesus in mystery. Today. What was your week like? What was the end of my end of this year like for me? Jesus Christ sustained me. He, he is not some faraway person up there. No, he lives in me. I live in him. And his presence in God, in, in heaven, assures my presence there one day. And so he can for you as well. Whatever it was. Whatever it was. You know, and, and one of the things I tell myself now, don't you get up there and try to gain people's sympathy by saying things and that I have no interest in doing at all. But I'm going to tell you what is the worst time for me, not morning, not noon, but night. But night. When I have to, when I have to think, Lois and I used to do this together. We would be praying at this time. We'd be reading the scriptures at this time. And then I realized this. Lois was not my life. Jesus Christ was. And so Jesus Christ kept us together. He has called her there, but he continues to pray for me here. And that's why, my friends, I'm standing here in the midst of sometimes it, it becomes, you know, for me to be teary is something else because it doesn't come easy for me. But I tell you this, every time I think, every time I want to be taken down in why, and, and, and perhaps the worst, the worst thing for me, the worst thing for me was to see my wife there the last few hours before her death. That was the worst. But every time I think of it, I turn my eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus in mystery. Let me close. Jesus in perpetuity. And forever. That's the future. Yesterday, he made, he walked on earth, he made statements. Today, he keeps me. He's mindful of me. He represents me in heaven. He sustains me on earth. And now, the writer said, forever, forever. That's the future. This is referring to his person. When it says that Jesus is the same, he's talking about his character, his person, his promises. Those things will never, never change. Jesus lived from Friday to Sunday, to, but with God, the, the word change is a, is, a, is, a, is a human word, not with God. God is conscious of changes because he knows everything. But God does not change to meet new challenges of the day. He is constant. He is reliable. He is unchangeable so that we can always depend upon the fact that he who made those promises when he was on earth, who prays for us now that he's in heaven, will never break those promises he has made. Will never break them. Even though we see things that might be contrary to sight, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And we can trust them the same, the same, the compassionate Jesus who looked at the little babies and said, let them come to me. The compassionate Christ who said to the woman, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus never changes in his person. His promises remain constant. And those promises are ours forever and ever and ever. And Paul puts it this way. One day, 
all the promises will be fulfilled and sight, a faith, will give way to sight and we shall see him as he is. So we will see the Savior one of these days. He's the same forever. He's not changing with things. Things do not change the promises of God. Jesus made promises to us that we do not yet see them being fulfilled. How do I answer that? I go to Hebrews chapter 11, the last verse. It says, these died believing the promises, but yet they have not seen them fulfilled. Die in faith. Die in faith, you die in expectation. The same, the same. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, Jesus was symbolically the rock that cared for you back there in the wilderness. The disciples experienced the presence of Jesus caring for them in Galilee, in Capernaum, in, 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 in different places he went. And now here's the Corinthians Paul is saying to them, that Jesus who walked there, that Jesus who is now, and that Jesus who is to come, is the Christ you can trust today. Now the, now the Corinthians are trusting Jesus. It was the Jews, it was the Gentiles, now it is the church. Life can be vicious and ugly, friends. But let me tell you, it can be made, you know, you, you watch that, that, uh, video last night where, where Ken Davis said, I want to, to live and I want to know him. Then for you and for me, my friends, when we have, when we have that stable, constant, unmovable rock, not only in the faith we have, but the one in whom we have faith, that nothing changes him. Time does not do away with his promises. Time does not shortchange him. He has made those promises and he will keep them. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But he's changeless. He's timeless. He's changeless. That means that there's no improvement in the character of Jesus. You only improve that which was not perfect. Perfect, Jesus was. If Jesus were to be changed worse or better, he couldn't be our savior. He'd be just like you and me. But no, he ever lives. And in that one, he, he goes before the Father in, in, in the today. And what he was before the Father, before there was time, he was to the Father in time. He is to the Father today, presently. And in Revelation chapter 1 we read, I am he that liveth, I am he that was and is and is to come. The perpetual contemporary. Jesus is adequate for any point in history and all points in eternity. Let's pray. Father, as we move to a new year, we, we might want to ask questions about how and when and why, but help us, Lord, not to look at what will take place, but who will control what is taking place. And so I pray I pray that you will grant a fresh sense of who you are, the unchangeable one, the one who has brought us to the end of one year and the one who will take us through. Nothing new will happen that excludes the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He knows the end from the beginning. Help us to find him a sufficient savior the one who can take care of our sins of yesterday, our sins of today, and our sins of tomorrow, because he ever lives to intercede for us. He is the con perpetual contemporary. May we see him today with fret the eye of faith. And Father, meet the new year 
looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, even Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us the power of the cross. Hebrews chapter 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Praise God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we come to receive the symbols of your eternal sacrifice 
Five bleeding wounds, says the hymn writer, he bore, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayer, they strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry, nor let that ransom sinner die. I pray that each of us who reaches forth to take the bread and the cup will remember that it is a testimony that we believe that Jesus Christ died for us, rose again, interceding for us, and will come again for us. Give us, Lord, a fresh appreciation for the perpetual contemporary of Jesus Christ, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Take a minute, friends. Lift your own hearts to God. He will hear you where you are. And he will work even when we don't see him working. Amen. Uh, John and Paul will come and serve the Lord's Supper. I've asked uh, Pastor if I could give a quick testimony. You guys were praying for us uh, as we were in Los Angeles at the airport trying to get out to Seattle. And as you know, flights were being canceled and canceled. Go ahead, you guys. And uh, um, anyway, you guys are praying for us as we're sitting at the airport. And you know, the pastor's talking about past, present, and future. Uh, there we are sitting, trying to get on a plane, which is past. And as, as we're praying, and I asked the Lord, you know, we need, we need to get on a plane. Anyway, the people were rolling from one flight to another flight to another flight, and we went from like 60 in line to... 50 in line and you know all of a sudden he took the four o'clock flight and moved it to five o'clock and the five o'clock to six but the 430 stayed there and <coughs> Pam went and put our name on the list that there's only five on and six <laughs> we, we ended up getting on that flight <coughs> and made it back to Seattle. And so I don't know how God can arrange to do all that, but he did for us, and we are here because I, I believe that you guys were praying for us. I was not aware of the fact that they had changed the content in this, and I like this a lot better. It's, I think it it speaks more of what it is all about. Remember that Jesus was now in heaven, but then he spoke to Paul about his being on earth, the night in which he was betrayed. It happened in Jerusalem when he was on earth. And he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, I pray that the truth of what this really means will grip our souls this morning. That his body was given. He went on the cross instead of me, instead of us. And we are thankful this morning for Jesus Christ who was willing and for God who, was, who gave him to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen.
In the same way, he took the cup after supper and he blessed it. He says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. That is, Jesus Christ will never change from what he was on earth as he is in heaven. He is the same today and forever. And if we get to heaven, it, we will be there because he shed his blood. And when we live in heaven, we will celebrate the fact that he gave his blood that we might be there. So we take the cup with thanksgiving to him. <clears throat> Father in heaven, please give us hearts that are overflowing with gratitude to God for all that he has done and for who he is. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please stand. I'm going to ask you to read what is before us on the screen before we come to our closing song. Let's read together. Because this is what happened in heaven after they celebrated the, the salvation that came to us. Let's read together. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worship God, saying, Amen. Amen. Blessing Blessing and glory and and wisdom and thanksgiving and and honor and and power and and might be to our God forever and ever. ever. Amen. Let's sing our closing song.
Let me close this service with this beautiful benediction from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times, and in time, and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Happy New Year to you. And you may want to greet one another with that greetings as you say good day for the celebration of this day. Thank you.